I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to James Basson of Scape Design. James runs his design practice along with wife Helen out of the south of France and they're part of a design school amongst which are counted Thomas Rayner and Claudia West, James Hitchmo and Nigel Dunnett and Olivier Philippi, a school which has become synonymous with the naturalistic style, the use of native plants and often the implementation of matrix or grid planting to populate large areas of landscape. It was this part of James's practice that initially sparked my interest and we get round to talking about that towards the end of the interview. But first, we cover the type of work undertaken by Scape Design and the gardens James designs for some of the most demanding environments. We started the design practice in 2000, I think, in the south of France. Um, I'd spent uh, two years working for a guy called Ross Palmer, a Kiwi, um, in London, in Islington. And then we moved out here and um, had babies and got bought a house and did all those things pretty quickly. So we had to get working pretty fast and make money. So we were doing maintenance and build. Then we did design and build and slowly um, developed into just a design practice. But we spent seven years making gardens, which was um, a great post-school thing to do because you really learn about how how things are made and how long things take and how expensive things are and all that sort of stuff. So it really helped us understand our business. Um, and also the maintenance side, the main, you know, understanding what, what maintenance is and what a pain it is to do stuff that's really irritating that some designs that you make end up being, um, frustrating for gardeners. So we sort of, I think we've been always quite focused on what we're putting into gardens how they're going to be maintained as sort of a big part of our work. Um, I came from landscape painting, so I've sort of got a sort of diff- potentially different look on the, my take on landscape is not, gardens is not really gardens. I've not really ever been very interested in gardens, much more interested in landscapes. I spend a lot of our time walking this amazing landscape in the south of France in the Alps, or Alp Maritime. Um, and looking at what works in the landscape and then applying that to gardens. So a lot of our work has been about um, translating landscape into gardens, especially the plants down here, making gardens that are sustainable so you don't need irrigation, working with the plants that grow wild naturally here and sort of all around the Mediterranean basin. And do you work mainly in France or do you work internationally? Yeah, mostly, most of our work in France. Probably 75% and the rest is um, show garden work really. We seem to do about three show gardens a year and have been doing for the last 10 years. Um, probably not that many, but probably done about 20, 25 show gardens. And that's taken us all over the world, which has been really brilliant and been very lucky to meet some fantastic designers and you kind of get stuck with them in a hotel. So you um, really cross swords with them and you know, get to meet a whole range of people and ideas and see a whole bunch of different cultures, Japan and China and America and Singapore and all over really. So it's been really um, a great opportunity for us to make something creative and um, a little bit out of the box and less restrained by all the... Um, all the client um, considerations you have to make normally, so that's been a good good fun, and it got us got us travelling, which is good good fun too. I often wonder if somebody approached you and said, um, you know, please come and do this garden in, I don't know, wherever, wherever in the world, somewhere somewhere else. Um, yeah. Would you, because your garden design is based around a really comprehensive knowledge of landscapes and ecosystems particularly, as you say, where you live and the plants and, and how everything works together, would you accept a commission somewhere where you, you weren't familiar with the planting and the terrain and all the rest of it? And if you did, how would you go about researching that project? I think um, I wouldn't be... I'm not that excited by um, abundancy. So anything that's sort of tropical, um, 
that really doesn't float my boat. So anything that anything is difficult. So if, if the landscapes um, are difficult for some reason or another, like dry or um, I'm not sure really. And dry is my main thing. Probably cold. I'm really t- drawn towards the north, so I'll probably be interested in doing something up there. I'd be spending time in the landscape again, looking at the landscape, seeing how it works, what what is the language of that landscape, and then trying to use that to sort of inspire the garden. I think I'd be if I get up, got out of dry, then I'd have to. I'd be a bit. Um, it'd take me some time to work out what plants work. Dry dry seems to be the place where I'm, I've had the most experience and so I've got a, a good kind of backdrop of plants that I understand and I understand how plants deal with dryness. Potentially if I was working in bog, I'd have it taken me a bit longer. So obviously you need to build resilience into the gardens that you design. Do you do that with hard landscaping as much as the planting? Yeah, well in dry landscapes, um, the hard landscape is really important because in the summer months when the clients are here, they're generally um, at their worst. So if the hard landscaping isn't um, sculptural and doesn't have its own kind of power and sense of place, then um, the garden generally looks pretty terrible. So um, it's been an important part of our practices to, to design and kind of use the hard landscaping to give a strong garden landscape sense already before we sort of use plants to embellish that. How important is it to incorporate plants that are, to all intents and purposes, low maintenance or resilient in certain situations? Well, low maintenance means, um, doesn't mean no maintenance. We had a, Our first client was a lawyer and um, he held me to the fact that I said no maintenance and that was a disaster. And low maintenance for us means um, sort of artistic maintenance. Um, what we really want now is our gardeners to um, work creatively in a garden instead of like the drudgery of mowing and blowing, more the sort of selective weeding, selective pruning, sculptural pruning, that kind of work. And, and then additional additional planting, moving plants, dividing plants, like the original gardening practice which means that actually the gardens aren't really, they are kind of low drudgery, but they're not low maintenance. And um, I think what really makes great gardens is is the maintenance. And if there's no, um, if there's no maintenance, if there's no gardener involved, then most of our gardens just become very wild and woolly. And at that point, they kind of lose their real garden quality and become just wild obviously that's a process of ongoing editing but when you design your landscapes they are very naturalistic do you go in with yeah. any really strong design principles that underpin your work which stops the areas that you design from completely melting into the landscape beyond you know where do you draw a line to separate the cultivated yeah. from the uncultivated i think we um we work with a lot of different species every time we make a garden and so we'll pluck out the landscape surrounding landscape plants that um, come from that landscape so they sort of make sense as they roll through the garden and then we'll bring in a whole bunch of new plants that um, are new to landscape and therefore um, they'll kind of flower later in the year or they'll do something that we were interested in and then we are two sort of standard kind of rules are is to create a rhythm in the garden and we often do that with sort of sort of drifts or bands of different planting sort of crossing the garden often herbaceous and grassy and then shrubby and kind of sculpted domey so we have this sort of strong visual rhythm across the garden Um, and then we also try and create a dominant like three to six um, species which are going to like dominate the whole garden which means that the garden is readable the, the vegetation is readable often my early gardens they got um, too complicated and too messy because I had 10% of everything and now we're trying to do um, 35% of two things and you know and really 
give give a sense of dominance to something that's going to really make the garden feel like it's one whole piece of work. Hmm. And do you have um, kind of favourites that you use? Yeah, I think pistachio lentiscus is a for for me here at the moment. It's my sort of go to plant because it's very boring, which means it doesn't doesn't matter if I use it over and over again because it's not very noticeable. But in midsummer, it's bright green. It's really healthy. It looks it looks um, very happy. And a lot the problem with a lot of dry gardens is they can look a bit sad midsummer, and that's when our clients are here and they can go all brown and a bit dull. And this thing is bright and glossy, and you can prune it to any shape or form. It could be a small tree, or it could be a 10 centimeter high ground cover, depending on how you maintain it. So it's a real good um, hanger. Um, that I put a lot of vegetation through. It's probably my my real go to at the moment. Mm. And are you using a mixture of native and non native plants or are you using more of one than the other? Um I would say it's it's thirty percent native, so plants that are really growing in the surrounding landscape and the rest is um Mediterranean basin. I don't really go for much um, South African, although South African plants are useful because they're um, more summer flowering. Um, but I always find them looking a bit extraordinary in landscape. And the same with Australian plants. There's lots of Australians that will do quite well. But somehow I just think they sort of feel a bit odd at odds with the rest of the plants. So I try and stick to Mediterranean basin. And is there the potential for any of those to become invasive? And if there is, how do you mitigate that? Yeah, there is, and it's a it's a it's a worry with what we do. We're using a lot of Euphorbia rigida at the moment because it's a really um, uh, dramatic plant and gives a real sort of sculptural structural quality, and then it self seeds and it flowers brilliantly, and so it's a really brilliant plant, very useful. But it is um, self seeding really well, and so we are a bit nervous about that i think our big issues are the plants are self-seed anything that doesn't self-seed we're not really too worried um and those ones we have to keep an eye on and that's back to maintenance really and we're keeping an eye on where they're going and how they're working we really changed the soil to a certain degree in all of our gardens by bringing in lots of gravel and the surrounding landscapes generally aren't that so if a plant's really self-seeding well in our garden it probably won't do in the rest of the surrounding landscape because it hasn't got all that added mineral can you talk a bit about your matrix form of planting i know that we have discussed this in the past um but yeah. could you just touch on that and, and your, the ideas around it well i think it's um i read um james hitchmore and nigel dunnett produced a book called um let me come to me in a minute but they produced this brilliant book and they were talking about how uh, foresters um um, do planting plans to the point where it's not about the garden designer saying, oh, I think this lavender would look perfect here and oh, I think this rosemary would look perfect there, but actually giving, putting a pattern across the landscape and just filling that with a matrix. And that matrix, um, it doesn't really matter where each plant turns up in the garden because in the end you're trying to get this maybe rhythmic or strong graphic in some way, but pattern across the garden and if the rosemary and the lavender are in the opposite positions it doesn't really matter because you're trying to make this um, natural quality and so we produce these sort of formulas that we um, might sort of polka dot with some sort of structure and like underplant with some sort of ground cover but we generally like lay this matrix across across the garden bearing it bearing itself when it comes to shade or comes to full sun or comes to a wetter area. So it sort of evolves, but um, there's this sort of pattern which gets sort of draped across the landscape. And that's really worked well for us. Um, it also works well for speed of laying out. So gardeners, when they come to lay these, gar- these gardens out, um, they find it easy to do because we're not saying, we're not too uptight about where the plants end up. And we used to do these sort of um, spotty plans with symbols on for every individual plant and then the gardeners would go bonkers about trying to make that work and trying to lay it out <clears throat> and in the end um, they start making it up and we couldn't tell the difference so we realised that we just make it much more simple. And is there is that based on a particular size grid? Is it like, I don't know, 
two square meters per grid that then gets repeated, or does it vary? Um, I think it varies. Um, the more if the, if the surface area of the garden is bigger, then we'll use more species. Um, if we're working in a really small garden, we would still we would still do it. We'd probably reduce the amount of species so it doesn't get too too busy. And again, we'd make sure that we've got like dominant some dominant vegetation so it doesn't look too sort of brown. We want to give it sort of highlight. And would you say that there is kind of an uh, a lower and an upper limit as to how many species you would include in one of those grids? And um, we're working on that at the moment, and um, I didn't. I wouldn't want to go below five different species. So I guess if you've got five square meters, um, five plant square meters, twenty-five plants. Um, yeah, I think five would be my minimum. Otherwise, otherwise, it's, I mean, of course, you could just do some uh, monoculture of lavender, and I guess that's got its value. So it's not like it's wrong. But I think we would we would we would do minimum five and maximum. I guess it depends on the size of the area. If it becomes huge, we could have a couple of hundred. I think that would be fine as long as there's really real dominance. You know, there's a real kind of thirty percent of something which is really strong, so that it doesn't become just too um, too messy. And then presumably you put that together based on how those plants will interact with each other and how the root systems would develop and all the rest of it is that right yeah we're working on that i mean that is um the holy grail for me at the moment um we've sort of been looking at um into ecology studies the csr model which james and nigel will talk about about this sort of competitivity and values they're different plants and they're different um mechanisms for proliferating um, also, um, Claudia West and Thomas Rayner's work, um, is fantastic. And they, they've sort of pulled out of ecology as well. They've pulled out the fact that some plants proliferate, um, by self-seeding. So you often spot them through a landscape and some plants through running. So you kind of group them through a landscape. And so there's these patterns of, um, patterns of laying plants out relative to how they will, um, grow in a landscape. And so we're, we're sort of, kind of accumulating all that information at the moment to try and um, produce solutions that are long lasting and will evolve and initially look look right in the landscape when we lay them out and then evolve in a um, communal way. And when you say we're collecting that, is that you in your design studio? Yeah. Uh, well, with our design studio is sort of um, getting a little bit bigger in a in a um, cons- consultant kind of fashion because we're working with a brilliant girl who's working who's sort of um, an analyst and database uh, miner and sort of a real a real geek and then another geek who is a computer programmer so um, we've come along <clears throat> with our knowledge which is quite horticultural and sort of lacking that real as far as I'm concerned, the real heart of the, the subject is ecology and botany and seeing plants in their natural environment. It's all very well all this information we get from um, websites which have seen plants grow in the garden environment, but the garden environment is a um, wholesome soil with wholesome amount of water and a wholesome amount of sun and everything's kind of perfect. And so the plant grows in a very different way to how it would grow in the wild. And so it doesn't almost doesn't have to fight to survive it gets garden to survive and we want to see how plants um, work in the natural environment because then they have to fight to survive and they're the plants that you can um, that's the understanding you, you need to sort of create systems which will um, evolve as a, as a community so that sounds like a massive undertaking um, you know are you using your observation and your knowledge to input into that database yeah so a lot a lot of the initially it's a lot of um trawling internet trying to find um sources and information there's um uh, pignati and someone else two italians who did this amazing study of the whole of the italian flora in the wild and they graded every single variable that they thought was relevant to how they manage in the wild and so 
We sort of use that data crossed with other data from other ecologists, other botanists. So we're sort of getting this proven data as far as um, the acad academic world is concerned. And then um, I'm throwing in my own um, understanding and also potentially I'm I'm dragging that up and down in this big spreadsheet. Um, so once I've understood that Achillean millifolium behaves in a certain way, then Achillean millifolium series queen or whatever it's going to be called will probably be, behave in the same way. So I'm sort of I'm sort of spreading that information and um, doing some guesstimating to see how these things would evolve in the end. And are you doing that based just on your region? Um, well, my no, I think I'm sort of taking the understanding that I've understood from my region. So if um, Lavangela angustifolia folgate behaves in one way, then that angustifolia pigcot blue will invade will behave in a similar way. If I've understood that, then I can pretty much guesstimate that every Achillean millifolium will behave in the same way, even if it's not from my region, even if it's from the north. You know? At some point, plant behavior is um, is species-specific. It may not be... It's genera and species-specific, but probably not cultivar-specific. At the point of cultivar, then most things behave in a similar way. You would get the database of plants and know how they behave and then presumably you would input the data from a garden and things like soil moisture content you know sun all the rest of it would you would you then plug that in and see what kind of gelled yeah so at the moment we're working with a, a database called soil grids which is um, sort of fuzzy data to a degree it's an assessment of uh, the world's soils and climate and it sort of amalgamated a lot of information and come up with best guest situation for every site around the world. And then um, we cross-reference that with our knowledge of a specific site. So we'll, it'll say, okay, your soil is this. And if we don't like that completely, we'll, we'll nudge it up and down to make sure it feels about right. Then we'll produce a list of plants um, that are uh, most likely to survive in that landscape. And then we rework that list until we get something which also suits um, the kind of look of the garden we're trying to design. So effectively, if that database works um, and gets rolled out, I guess will you maybe be um, eliminating the need for garden designers? <clears throat> well, um, it's a, I guess it's the same debate as whether Google got rid of... Um, got rid of libraries um, um you know initially we used to go to libraries to do our research and it used to take us two weeks now we um use google and it takes us two hours and this instead will take two minutes but it's the same it's the same kind of information just re reprocessed to make it quicker and easier for designers to use it's not kind of it's not removing that information or um you can go back into that information and, and spend hours going back into the books or hours sort of trawling the internet, or you can spend a couple of minutes um, looking at the results produced by a database which has used all that information. And if you're not sure about it, you can go back and, and double-check yourself. So it's just a sort of a speed thing more than a um, eradication thing. And so designers, um, you know, we're all trying to work to a budget and a, time, a timeline. This is just the idea is it just helps them work faster. So it doesn't actually churn out the matrix plan as a done deal. Well, there's there's sort of we're we're thinking that maybe um, there's a few kind of levels. No designer is going to want to work with something that tells them what plants they should choose, but they are going to be really pleased if we give them a list of plants that really work and they're working in their to to their aesthetic choice, like the colours are right or the shapes are right or the transparency is right or whatever they're after. And if we give them a list of 20 plants that they can choose from, they're going to love that because they've got a problem like me, that they really love all plants probably, and then they've got 200 that they want to use, but we're going to say, well, actually only 20 would work. So you choose out the 20. So that's, that's for designers. We think that's the way to work. We give them a whole bunch of, a bunch of lists that they choose from, but those lists are much shorter than um, the RHS um, plant finder guide. And then um, for, punters for, for clients who um, 
can't afford a garden designer or want to have a go themselves, then we potentially could produce a list of plants that um, that are sort of pre-selected. And so, yeah, then at that point, the designer's role is um, not ne- not necessary, not needed, and those clients are there anyway. So I don't think it's replacing them. I think it's just um, helping helping clients who can't afford a designer or want to have a go themselves make their own decisions or make their own gardens without us. Hmm. And is the idea that it would eventually tie up to nurseries so that you could just effectively go, okay, well, I've got this database of plants. I want to know the availability. Okay, I can see that I like those five choices. They're available. I can get them delivered. And so it's kind of like a, you know, beginning to end system. Yeah, ideally, it'd be nice to have another level to it and that um, nurseries are involved. And so the list produces only plants that are available. Another thing that us designers have a real issue with is we spend hours making these plant lists and we get really seduced by this lovely planting design we've come up with and then we can't find the plants and it's super frustrating. Or we have to find the plants from five nurseries and that takes days and we lose money and time and, and it's a real very frustrating part of the planting design process. And so if we were connected to a whole bunch of nurseries, we could, you could select that you only want them from a local nursery. So we deal with that issue of um, carbon footprint, of um, finding plants from too far away, or we find one nursery that produces all the plants and therefore you don't have to shop around in many different nurseries. So there's, there's potentially a tie on to that. But initially what we're really, really excited about is, um, kind of dealing with that madly complex problem of planting design, which is the soil plus the weather plus the client's choices plus the designer's choices plus the plus the plus. So it just becomes this massive mathematical, ecological debate, which takes forever. And um, designers often are artists, but potentially not ecologists or botanists or horticulturists. They've got you know one feather to their arrow, not um, 20. And so is it arrow to their quiver or whatever that is? But, you know, we're we're expected to understand a lot of different things and um, all spend hours and hours but not be able to charge for it. So, or produce the same planting list for everybody because then we don't have to bother our heads too much about it. So this is just a tool, really, just another another, another way of managing it. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so you're aiming to be the uh, Sergey Brin of the planting world. When will this go live or when would you like it to go live? Do you have any ideas? We'd like to um, produce this, the database and the um, the initial database and the initial kind of list format for designers. We'd like that to come out um, this summer. Um, it won't be perfect, but we think it's better to get it out there and um, and start sort of sharing that we want it to be a free online service that um, designers can can go online and use and produce plant lists and we really want their feedback to understand whether that's whether it's a goer really whether it's producing plants lists that people are interested in if there's things we haven't really thought about and to try and sort of improve that but that initial I don't know 200 day piece of work we put in um, we want to give it out free so that people can have a go and see if it works and um, see if people get excited about it and see if it's um, see if it's something that um, people would use cool well when it goes live will you let me know and then I can let everyone who's listening know <laughs> alright we'll do Perfect. sure thing so watch this space thank you very much to James for sharing an insight into his work and for talking about his new project Personally, I find the advancement of technocracy into an arena such as landscape design quite scary, but I find it hard to articulate quite why without resorting to ethereal and abstract concepts. One book that deals with this issue is Charles Eisenstein's Climate and New Story, which is an interesting read and does exactly what it says on the tin. Taking a reductionist approach to plants and landscapes seems almost inevitable if we continue along our current path, but I can't help resenting it. Maybe it's a simple fear of the unknown and resistance to change. Or maybe we should listen to our instincts, even if we can't fully justify why. As always, a huge thanks to you two for listening. And I won't catch you next Tuesday because from now on, the podcast will be released on a Monday. 
And as of next week, there'll also be an additional segment at the end of each interview too, which I hope you'll enjoy. So catch you in six days. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod But please also check out my Patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.